Today we are continuing our study of the Sermon of the Mount. Um, as we spend time studying the chapter 6 of Matthew, especially, that is uh, all uh, containing many, many uh, instructions for Christians, for disciples of Christ. And uh, we are in a series about how to deal with our finances and how God wants us to manage and steward all the riches that he has entrusted in us. Now, uh, I come today with this topic or this title of this sermon, Choose Your Master. And, and from the scripture that you, we just read today, and as I always prepare this reflection questions and uh, questions for discussion in your bulletins, you can uh, answer this question that I prepare for you. And actually, this is a, a good material to, to discuss. So um, once again, I encourage you to uh, create a discussion group and also to try to share what we have learned here in, in our ministry every Sunday from this scripture that we read and meditate every week. Now, many theologians will say that the Sermon of the Mountains is for the New Testament what the law in the Old Testament in Exodus was given to Moses. Jesus gave to the people uh, of Israel in his time a new law, a new commandment, as Moses gave to the people of Israel in the Exodus, in this Mount of Sinai, the Ten Commandments, the regulations and principles of the kingdom of God for the people of Israel who were out of Egypt into the journey of the Promised Land. Now, Jesus gave these sermons on a mountain, and this mountain symbolically is the Mount of Sinai in the Old Testament. It is the mountain where God gave the law to his people. Now, many theologians agree that this Sermon of the Mount is not for no Christians, but is for Christians, those who are already in the kingdom of God, those who are called to be members of the kingdom of heaven. But it's interesting that in this world, those who are no Christians, those who are no Christians, they are not interested in any other part of the scripture or any other part of the Bible or the New Testament or the Old Testament that it sounds for no Christians some kind of mystic literature or some kind of uh, over-expressed writing except for the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, presidents and, and politicians, they always try to use the Sermon on the Mount as an example of creating laws or to try to uh, uh, give light, uh, guides for society. And there were some theologians, liberal theologians, they, they say, okay, if we take out of the Bible all the mysticism, all this, this literature or these writings that looks like the gods of the Greeks, that they are superpower people or superpower uh, uh, miracles in the Bible, and we, we just try to, to have a, a literature or a, a scripture that is for the sense common of every person who is, in quotation, normal, they say that we only have the Sermon on the Mountain as the only scripture that we can follow for normal people. Now, they call normal people, not Christians. So many people who are believers and are, are not believers, they are focusing what the Sermon on the Mountain is and what their teachers are. And once again, these teachings are so full of, of riches of blessing for those who believe that no believers, they want to know where's our 
source of blessing. And as we started with this, the study of the Beatitudes, many non-Christians, they want to imitate Christians, if they find one real one. The problem these days is that many Christians, they don't know the Bible. They don't know God's word. And therefore, they don't know how to be like Jesus, how to think like Jesus, how to speak like Jesus, how to act like Jesus. What will Jesus do in each circumstances in our life? That's what we, many Bible teachers teach to the Sunday school students. But the problem these days, many people, they don't read the Bible. So they don't know what Jesus thinks and what God thinks. And therefore, people try to just imitate the world instead of imitating Jesus. It's a very important time of history that we are living today that the church has to stand up and study and teach well the word of God against the spirit that is in the world. The spirit of the deceiver, Satan, who is a liar, who is a thief, who is a destroyer, who wants to kill, destroy, and take away all sorts of happiness in our life. We started to bless you with God's word. And God wants to bless us as he put his spirit, his character in us, the Beatitudes. But he wants to continue blessing us also in our finances. The question is, are we are ready to serve our God? Choose then who will be the one you want to serve. You know, from cover to cover, the Bible teaches that we were created to be dependent. God created us to depend in Him alone. But even though no Christians, they are dependent of something, even though they want to be independent of God. Actually, that's what happened in the, the Garden of Eden. The first temptation that the serpent gave to the man was to be independent from God. They have a good relationship and they depend on God as their source of blessing and happiness. But the devil who is a, a thief, a deceiver, a destroyer, he tried to take away the happiness of men by making the men be independent from God. But even for those who doesn't believe in, in the Bible, they always depend on something. And we all, all Christians too. We are created to depend on, from the very moment that we have life. First from our parents, first from our uh, mother in, 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 our, in their wounds, then from our parents for, for life, for, for food, for education. We depend on, on, on education for be successful or be a, a, a person in a, in, in a society. We depend on our, our friends to integrate in a culture. We depend from a career to, to assure our independence from our parents. <laughs> we depend on, our, on a degree to gain more incomes or a better position in the market. We depend on relationships to be sociable. And we depend from, from good health condition to keep our body work. And we depend on our savings to be ready for in the times of need. We depend, we depend on our family when we get old. And in every circumstance in our life, we depend on something. Now the question is, what I choose to depend on? What I choose to depend on? We are created to be depending from God and everything that God provides for us. But we, in our nature, we want to be independent from God. But we are still depending on something because we are created to be dependent. Now, the question is for Christian and not Christian, what are you depending on? Or where you want to put your dependency? 
Today the scripture tells us that we can choose to depend on God, our creator, or to depend on the riches of this world. We say the last week to make treasures in heaven, to store up the treasures in heaven, says the Bible. But this word store up in the original Greek word is treasure. And, and we can paraphrase again this verse like treasure, treasures in heaven. To treasure something in heaven. To, it's not just store it up, but it's to treasure something. And what we treasure, it means that what we, we value in our life. And that what we value must be first in God's kingdom. Must be first in heaven. Now, as we already said the last week, what are the treasures? The treasures are no money, are no accumulation of wealth in this world, but they are people. The kingdom of God is not about a palace. It's not about a castle. It's about people. Church is not a building. Church are those who call the name of the Lord and those who are transformed by his power, by his word, and knowing and enjoying forever. So the kingdom of heaven is not about a church or a building. It's about people. We are the treasures of the kingdom of heaven. And God came to search and to rescue and to pay for this treasure. The people who are in heaven. Now, since we are in the kingdom of heaven, we now have to know how to live in this kingdom and how to be blessed by the blessing that is stored out already in heaven to all of us. Now we continue in the scripture today in verse 21 and 23. And it says, For where your treasure is, there is your heart also. And it continues, The land of the body is the eye. Therefore, your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now, the, the chapter 6, talking about wealth or, or, or riches of the kingdom of heaven, they talk about two things, two treasures. The treasures that are temporal and the treasures that are eternal. The treasures that are in earth and the treasures that are in heaven. Now Jesus said, treasures, treasures in heaven, not tre treasures, treasures in earth. Or in other words, as the Bible said, don't store up treasures in heaven, but store out, I mean, don't store up treasures in earth, but store out treasures in heaven. So there are two treasures. And then he's, talk, he's talking about now about two eyes. Two treasures, two eyes, and as the scripture will say also, as we just read in 24, two masters. Two, two, two. But all these are in one heart. Now, the relation between eyes and hearts are very close. I'm not a doctor, so I don't need to explain you how they function, the relation between eyes and, and heart. But the Bible mentioned many times that we, we, we reflect in our eyes what our heart is. Now, you can see a person and how their face art every morning to read their hearts. So if a person have some eyes that are really looks like angry birds, then you know that their hearts are full of bitterness. Now, if you see a person whose eyes are really big and full of, of excitement, it's a person who has joy and peace in his heart. So you can read the heart just by seeing the eyes of people. Now, most of the people say that, as I see my picture since I was a, a child, that my eyes are full of worry. And every picture since I, I was a child, from all my birthday in, 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 in elementary, all that I see then, and my parents show me sometimes pictures, oh, this is where you, when you were a child, I just see my eyes like this. And I still have my eyes like this. And my wife all the time say, 
smile. <laughs> smile, because people think that you, you are angry. People think that you are, you are uh, uh, upset of something. I said, no, I'm just thinking about it. In my mind, there's a lot of things that, and, and my, my head is full of, 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 of things that I, that I have to do because of the sense of responsibility that I have. And sometimes we see that people that, who are around us, they have so much worries in their life. And those worries are reflected in, in the way they see. We want to talk about worries in next week. But let's continue with this relationship between heart and eyes. If our eyes are good, I mean, if we have some kind of lights or sparks, I will say, in your eyes, it's because we have no worries about, in our hearts, about what we are living, how we are living, or how we're going to live. As I said last week, the problem that people are treasure or storing treasures in airs is because they have worries and because they have also fear. So, have you ever seen eyes of fear? If you see eyes of fears, are, they are eyes of worries. People who have fears also, they look like very scary. Because if you, have, you see an animal who have fear, they want to attack. You probably see many times National Geographic. Look at the eyes of animals who are ready to attack. They don't, they, you don't see anger there. You see fear. And those people who are, are, are attacking others or are defended, they are like that because fear. Now, if we are worry or we let worry overcome our life, control our life, especially our heart, then we will be involved in dark or in darkness soon. And this darkness will lead us to depression, to worries, to anxieties, and to be away from God ultimately. God wants us to have good eyes for what we expect every day. Once again, we were talking about the, 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 how, how Jesus teaches us how to pray. And he said, when we pray, we should pray like this. God, give us today our daily bread. Now we have our trust in God that he will provide our daily, our daily bread, our, our daily needs, because bread means needs, our daily needs. But the problem is that we, if we have a bad, a bad eye, we are going to go beyond that provision to covet or to greed something. This Sermon of the Mountains reflects what we learn in the Mount of Sinai. And in the Mount of Sinai, God gave to Moses and the people of Israel through Moses the Ten Commandments. What is the Ten Commandments? What is the last co commandment in, in this tense? Do not covet. Do not covet. And it's interesting that when the people of Israel, they went out of Egypt, God blessed the people of Israel to don't go out with empty hands. He said, when you go after the, the Passover, when you go to the promised land, before you depart, ask to the Egyptians to give you all the goals and silvers and accessories and everything that they can bless you. You. And the people of Israel, they take from the Egyptians, not because they stole from them, but because they just opened their hands and the Egyptians say, okay, go, get out, and if you need money for your travel and for your, for your, your, your train ticket or your airplane ticket, here you are. And they just planning and sitting away as soon as possible. They don't want that they come back, oh, but I, I left my, 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 my bank account in, in, in my, my room. No, 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 just go. They hurry them to leave the country. They were scared to death because all the firstborn child of children of Israel, the Egyptians have died. Now, they were out of Egypt with full hands of riches and wealth. God allowed them. But as soon as they arrived to the Mount Sinai 
and Moses went to receive the law in the mountain of God, the people of Israel, with all this gold that they bring from Egypt, they mail, they made a golden calf. In other words, they make an idol. They make another god. After all the miracles that they saw in Egypt, and after all the miracles that they saw in, in the process of going to the Mount Sinai, as God opened the, the seas and made all these miracles, the manna, and how God provided for them, they make another god, an, an idol, and they say to the people of Israel, these are the gods who brought you from Egypt, or from, who brought you out of Egypt. And today, we are similar, or I would say the same like the people of Israel in, in the desert. God bless us to receive grace, God bless us to, to be rich in grace and blessing in this world for everything that we can do according to his plan until the day we go back to heaven. But as soon as we have everything that God provides for us, we want something more. And we are not satisfied with what we have. Why? Because we have an eye to covet something. Something else. We try to serve God and we also try to have some kind of security possession that we can hold and see with our own efforts the people of Israel they have bad eye and that's why they covet other gods they said the people the other countries they have their gods why we have to have only one God. They have many gods. So when the people of Israel made this calf, they didn't say, this is your God, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. They said, these are your gods, in plural. Willing to have not just one God, but many. Because they couldn't stand to have just only one God, whose name is Jehovah. And as the people of Egypt, they have many gods. They want to be like them. They covet more gods. And they say, well, Moses is not here. God probably is up there. He killed Moses with this foreign fire in the mountain. And God didn't spoke anything else after that for 40 days. So let's make another god, just in case. They have a backup, just in case. And we try to do the same thing today. Treasures, as we just read in the scripture, represent accumulation of what is valuable. Materials was important to the people of Israel since it was often seen as a sign of God's blessing and the reward for obedience to him. We have the example of Abraham. We have the example of Job in the Old Testament that they were recognized to be blessed by God because of the wealth that they have in store. Now the accumulation of wealth of its own sake is deceptive according to the Bible too because one can find in material treasures a false sense of security or an equated assessment of one's spirituality. So the Lord Jesus says to the people of Israel, do not store out or do not treasure for yourself treasures on earth because he knows that the people of Israel they say oh if we are prosper in earth that means that we are blessed by God and they try to put a measure of blessing from God for the things that they have stored in earth Jesus was talking now to the people of Israel the Pharisees the Sadducees who were proclaiming to be wealth and to be blessed by God. And many theologians say that this sermon was for the people in that time who were not rich. And Jesus wanted to encourage them to not be resentful for their poor conditions. Martin Luther says, 
What a man love, that is his God. For he carries in, in his heart, he goes about with it day and night. He is live and waits with it, and be it what it may wealth or pelf, pressures or renown. What we love, that could be our God. But God, as a master, as a God, demands and is dominant. And he say, you cannot love riches and me at the same time. Actually, one of his commandments said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Don't give him any space for nothing that can be a way of our expression of love to God. He wants to be the first to be loved. So God cannot give us any other space for another love in our hearts. Doesn't mean that because we love God, we, don't, we won't love our parents, we won't love our brothers and sisters, we won't love our friends. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that God is the first one. I'm going to talk later about this, the principle of first. But God wants to see if you love him more than anything else. Now, if, if you don't love God, how can you love your parents? How can you love your wife and, and, and husband? How can you love your children? How can you love your friends? How can you love yourself? Because Jesus says in the second commandment, love your neighbors as yourself. But if we don't know our labor, we're going to covet, we're going to steal, we're going to kill, we're going to be adulterers. We're going to lie. We won't respect our parents. And in, other, in other words, we won't keep the commandments of God. How we serve. What we're going to serve. Serve means belong wholly or be entire under a command too. Now when, when Jesus was talking about to serve or God or the riches or the treasures, he was talking about not to be an employee but to be a slave. The word serving in the Bible is not an employee. It's not that you, or because of what you've done, you're going to receive a salary, and therefore you have done your job. The Bible mentions about servant because they were slaves. The concept of a slavery. It means that you are not free. You are not in your own. You have to give account of what you have what you do to a master. As the title of the sermon is, Who is your master? Or choose your master. We see now that Jesus said, You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve the riches of this world, or the materialists of this world, and God at the same time. It doesn't work. It will never serve. Because you cannot have two honors. Once again, it's a concept of a slave. One slave cannot have two masters. So when Jesus said you cannot serve two masters, he was saying you cannot be a slave of two masters. The Apostle Paul, when he greeted the churches in Mino Asia, he said, Paul, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he said, the slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was identifying himself as one who have an honor, as one who have someone who have control his life, his provision, and even his health. He depends on God all the time and what God can do in his life. The book of Exodus teaches that God have a plan to enrich the people of Israel with wealth, but the people of Israel went to their way of or the path of idolatry instead of the path, the path of worship to God. And God had to teach the people of Israel how to prioritize or 
to set apart what is the first sins first. He teach the people of Israel to keep the Sabbath, and then later he teach the people of Israel to tithe. We have to learn how to use our finances well. God bless us already, materially, physically, emotionally, in any aspect. But we are the one who wants to make another God, especially a golden one. If we don't learn how to put God first and his kingdom and serve for his righteousness, we're going to fall down in the same thing of idolatry. Even the poor of this war have a purpose in God's plan. Stephen, Stephen Jobs, when he was a child, says this story that, uh, his, in his biography that he went to a Catholic priest in a Catholic church and asked to this priest, is God alive, Father? He called Father to the priest. And the priest said, yes, he does. He's alive. Then Job continued with another question. If God is alive, why he do nothing? Why he does nothing? about the poor and those who are suffering in the war. Since this priest couldn't give an answer that pleased to Stephen Jobs, he resolved to leave the church and to stop to believe in this God who does nothing about the poor and those who are suffering in this war. And he remained in that way until the very end of his life. But interesting that even though with all the riches that he accumulates Stevie Jobs with his enterprise and his famous company, Apple, he never tried to be the person that he want God or he demand God to be, to resolve the problem of poverty and the sufferings in the world. Yeah, some people will say, well, yes, he, he give to the world the blessing that we have now, the Apple iPhone, and he made many people like happy and that's why they call him a hero for make people's life happy but I don't think that instead to make people's life happy he made people slaves slave of iPhones and all this technology that he created and the only one who benefits of this is his company so he made money with all the happiness of those who buy his products slavery Masters, happiness, poor, suffering. Hmm. How can we connect these words with one simple message that we have today? God has a purpose for every person, and that's the problem that Stephen Joe didn't understand. That God has a purpose even for the poor of this world. God has a plan for the, the people who are rich in this war and has a plan for people who are poor in the war. And because some country or some people in this war are poor doesn't mean they are not happy. I can prove you that there are more happy people in poor countries than people who are here in Korea that is called a rich country. I can show you about many people who are in some way suffering in Africa or in Latin America or in Asia because they are poor countries but they have more happy life than many people who have all the last version of wealth or materials or cars in this country and in their life full of worry disease broken families bad relationships with one another what is the difference? They are serving the wrong God. They are serving the wrong master. Yes, we have to choose what we want to depend on. What I choose to depend on? On myself? On the riches of this world? Or in God? We were all created to be dependent on something. But it's our decision to put our dependence on someone or in something. I want you and I pray that you made the right choice 
to depend only on God. Another question that we have here is, it is money evil? That's why many Christians ask this question. Okay, well, serving God, serving riches, that's no possible. It's no natural uh, evil. So what about money? Is money evil? The scripture said today that we cannot serve two masters or we cannot serve God and the riches. Now the Kingsley version, different than the NIV version, doesn't use the word riches or treasures. He used the word mammon. Mammon. Now what is mammon? As you see in the questionnaire that I have today. Mammon is the Greek word for, or is in Greek word is mammon, mammona, from the Hebrew or Aramaic word mammon. And it means also wealth, riches, and property. But mammon is a spirit who tries to replace God. It's not just a vocabulary, it's not just a noun. It was a spirit. And this spirit, according to many theologians, was ref go reflected and going back to the time of the Tower of Babel in Babylon. And this, in this Tower of Babel, that's the word Babel means confusion. People were confused about what to, which, which one they have to serve or how they have to live. And most of the people in that time who were building this tower, they tried to reach heaven. They tried to be independent. They tried to go away from God's punishment or the flow that happened before that generation. And they want to make their own life independent from just one God. The Apostle Paul would say to Timothy in chapter 6, verse 10, Love of money is the root of all evil. So, money is no evil in self. Money is neutral. The problem is that what spirit is holding this money? Or what spirit is controlling this money? We need money, as I said last week, for everything that we can achieve in this world. We need money for education. We need money for, for counseling and, and, and hospital for medicine, for buying food. Yes, money in itself is not evil. But the spirit that holds this money is what is called it, mammon. The spirit that is holding this treasure or what we value. The Sermon on the Mountain in chapter 6 of Matthew is also in some way, way quoted in the book of Luke. In his chapter 16, he also quoted or is synthesizing the Sermon on the Mountain in, in some way. But let's see what the Bible says also with the same portion of the scripture in the Sermon on the Mountain here in Luke chapter 16 from verse 9 to 13. And it says that, And I say to you, says Jesus, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. What are we going to do with riches? Or what are we going to do with mammon, with money? In other words, what are we going to do with what we have? Are we going to serve God? Or are we going to save this world? Or the spirit that controls this world? The Bible says in Corinthians that the spirit on the heirs 
of this war is the devil. There's a spirit in there. That's the devil. There's a spirit in, in these people of this war who are so material these days than before. And they put the trust in everything that they touch and see. But even though they try to be materialists, it's in this war, there is a thirst and hunger for spirituality as well. And you can see all this coming to this generation through video games, to characters, movies. That Hollywood, they tried using this character like Marvel characters, heroes, to teach spirituality to this generation. So, as the world say they don't want to be religious, they already are. And they put their faith in what they see. But let's analyze a little bit this. I don't, I don't have much time, but I don't want to just skip this. The Bible says here, make friends for yourself by the unrighteous mammon, or the unrighteous money or riches. Many people think, oh, the Bible is encouraging us to make friends with money or with evil money. But that's not what the Bible tried to say to us. It continues saying, they may receive you into the everlasting home. So who are these friends? They are not evil friends. They are those who are trying to make money with you or those who want you to make business. These are people who are already the treasures in heaven. These people or these friends are those who you, by the money that you make in this world, and even this money was made from people who are not Christians, this money that you have, or this income, or this salary that you have, you can put or redeem this money, given to God the 10% and the 90% to invest for treasures, more treasures in heaven. In other words, for make more people to know God and these people who are saved could be no Christians and that would be in your account in heaven that you evangelize these people who are no Christian but now you are investing your time, you are investing your riches, you are investing your energy so they can be in heaven and when you die and when they die they will welcome you in heaven and that is your treasure now. They will welcome you in heaven. Because you, these non-Christians who were spent with your time, fellowship, friendship, they are now Christian because of your investment. Because God poured in you so much blessing, so much wealth, that now you can use this money, this wealth, this time, and everything that you value in this world to make treasures in heaven. To make friends that will welcome you in heaven. Now, you will say, but pastor, I'm not rich. I don't have money to invest with friends. Well, you have time. You have love. You have energy. You have ability to, to invite people to, to listen to the gospel message. And if you are faithful in what is little, then God will push you in more. In other words, if you don't, you are waiting until you get rich to go to evangelize and go to, to mission trips or, 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 or do mission work, that will never happen. You're never going to be rich. Because God don't bless those who have money to make, to, to go to evangelize or to go to, 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 to mission trees. Actually, those who are going to mission trees or those who are evangelized, most of the people who are going there, they are not rich. They try to collect money or they, they raise funds funds in order to complete this mission. But those who have money, they never put a finger or they never try to invest in missions or in evangelization. If you are faithful in what you have right now and invest in the kingdom of God, God will pour you more in your life. I can put my hands on fire because, as I said the last week, I experiment by myself. God is faithful. 
He will never leave you alone. He will never fail you. Because God knows who have a sincere heart. It's just about the spirit that is in your wealth. Do you have the spirit of coveting? You have the spirit of idolatry, that you idolatry your riches, you idolatry your cars, you idolatry your, your apartments, or your friends, or your family, or your health, or your time, or whatever you have in this life, or even your, your education and your diploma, because people idolatry now education. And if you are a doctor, you are famous and other things. Or whatever you are, and at least that you have, you put the spirit of God, the spirit of faithfulness. Because one of the proof of the spirit is faithfulness. Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to Mammon? Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to the money that you want to make in this world? Many people, they, don't, they are not faithful these days. They prefer today to make money instead to come to church. They prefer to go to enjoy the war instead to come to church. They see it's more fun to go and enjoy their life and my time is treasure, is precious. What are I going to give my time to one boring, boring pastor in a boring church with few people they don't know what to do. That's what they think. They think that we are full because we just spend the whole day doing nothing. When they can go the whole day and enjoy the nature, they, they can go the whole day enjoy friends and the money that they have. Who is really our master and what is the end of this? As I said the last week, David was comparing with those who are rich and comparing himself who was suffering because he couldn't enjoy as much as the others. But God said to David, don't worry, they won't be there forever. Riches in this world are temporarily, but treasures in heaven are eternal. Where are you going to invest? What are you going to do? God is behind you. He's your guarantee. You need to make, to make more treasures in heaven, sources or anything that you want. God will respect you if you are faithful and righteous and seek first his kingdom in your life. Let's pray. I will thank you for today. You challenge us to be faithful to you as you remain faithful to all of us.